with a lot of athletes around the world and particularly here in Australia in some sort of restricted lockdown type period, you may not be able to get access directly to lab-based testing. And it's definitely the case with us. We're not able to test athletes in our performance lab here in Melbourne at the moment. So what are some of the alternatives? Today I'm gonna to go through how you can assess your VO2 max and get quite an accurate reading in a field-based setting. Hey guys, Nick here. Welcome back to the channel, talking everything science of endurance and sports science in general. If you're new to the channel and this is the first time you're watching, please consider subscribing down below. Just hit the big red button. And if you're already returning, you've watched a couple of videos, if you're already subscribed, make sure you hit the bell down below to keep up to date with the latest videos and you get notified if you hit that bell uh, every time I upload, aiming to get a few more videos out a week uh, at the moment. So make sure you do click the subscribe button and the bell uh, to keep up to date with all of those coming. But like I said in the introduction, we're talking about field tests for VO2 max. Now it's something I, I talk about uh, quite a bit in terms of lab testing and, and being able to get some really good quality data in the lab, understanding physiology and then what are the what's the back end of that? Like how do we then add that into training? How do we prescribe training? What types of training do we need to do? But I think it's really relevant to talk about the moment, particularly with a lot of athletes in Melbourne restricted to being at home, but in Australia, we've got quite severe restrictions at the moment. There's limitations to, do you even have access to lab-based testing depending on where you are as well? Um, so what I want to take you through is a couple of options for some field-based tests that you can do at home, you can do uh, with your own equipment. It's gonna allow you to get a very, very similar number in terms of VO2 max and an understanding there. And keep in mind, we're gonna be very specific to VO2 max today, and we're not necessarily talking about uh, threshold or FTP. I'll go into how you can understand some things around threshold and FTP from your VO2 max, but we're mainly focused on VO2 max because if we can understand where that top end point is, it gives us a benchmark of the entire aerobic engine, which I've talked about before. VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen we can take in transport and utilize. That is telling us if are we a V6 or are we a V8 engine, essentially. So if we know that number, we know everything below it and we can work off percentages of VO2 max and establish some rough training zones just to get you through until you're able to get to a lab test or to give you a reasonable idea, better than just going out and riding or, or running training completely on feel and going, oh, I think I'm going hard enough. At least this is gonna give you a starting point or a step in the right direction to some objective information. First of all, I'm gonna talk about cycling because it's a really easy one to do because most of us have some sort of indoor trainer or smart trainer like a Wahoo Kicker or a, or a Tax Neo that we can use to set up and, and perform some sort of test on. And this one, a lot of you may have already done it. I know it's ingrained in, in software like Zwift, uh, Trainer Road, a lot of a lot of different software um, setups like that will have a ramp test protocol built in. And that's essentially all we're doing. We're just replicating what we would do in the lab where we hook you up to the mask, etc. We're replicating the exact same protocol just on your trainer. So it's a really simple one. We actually call it a, a maximal aerobic power test or an MAP test. And the easy way to get to VO2 max is we start at 100 watts I might put a graphic up on the screen showing this. We start at 100 watts and then every minute we increase the wattage by 20 watts. So ideally you need some sort of power meter to do this or like I said, on a smart trainer, it's got power for you. If you've got something like a watt bike or a spin bike that has a power reading on the screen, that's ideal. If you don't, it is gonna be a little bit tricky because we, we're not gonna be able to maintain um, specific intensities and then, and then I guess translate that to the field and training. So power meter is kind of a must for, for this one from a bike perspective. But we start at 100 watts, every minute we go up by 20 watts, basically until we can't go anymore. So the aim is we you keep pushing and you stay at that wattage for the minute. At the end of the first minute, we go up to 120. We hold that for a minute, we go up to 140, etc. Let's say I get to 300 watts. I'm just gonna put a number out there because I'm not very big. I can't turn big power on the bike. So 300 watts is probably about right for me. Let's say I get to 300 watts. And then I try 320, I go, oh, I'm really struggling, but I'm gonna give it a go. And I only get 10, 15, maybe 30 seconds into that stage. What I'm gonna do at the end of that is wherever I can't turn the pedals anymore and sustain the wattage that I need to, so I'm pedaling along, I just can't hold 320, I keep dropping down too much, give myself one or two chances to get back up, no, nah, can't hold it, call it quits. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take the stage that I completely finished, because what we understand from, from VO2 Max is it's, it's the last stage, it's where you're gonna plateau in that oxygen consumption. Beyond that point, you might just be able to get them anaerobic bursts through, and we might overestimate VO2 max a little bit if you just say, oh, I got 10 seconds into the next one, so it must be that one is my finishing point, and that's my MAP, my max aerobic power, my VO2 max power. So we're gonna take the one, the last stage that you finished completely is the stage, or is the, the wattage that is gonna be your VO2 max wattage. Um, if you finish the stage and then decide you don't wanna go up to the next one, that's fine, but I'd really encourage you to try because you never know how far you're gonna get through uh, in that next stage until you give it a go. That's a really simple one. Um, so 
straight out one minute ramp test is exactly what we would do in the lab if we were just looking at VO2 max. Uh, and then you can actually use some different systems um, in terms of understanding percentages of max, things like around about 85 percent of vo2 max or 85 percent of maximal aerobic power is going to be where most people's ftp sits roughly um, you can start to match this up with heart rate you can monitor heart rate throughout the session and then have a look at some rough training zones based on heart rate and power you can really start to get a bit of a feel for where are things happening in my physiology and it's just a really simple test at most it's probably going to take you about 15 minutes um, you can start a little bit higher if you feel if you're someone you feel like you're definitely going to get to 400 450 maybe even 500 watts you probably want to start up a little bit higher, do a bit more of a warm up, and then start at something like 200 watts as, it, as your beginning point. There's no, I guess, right or wrong, as long as you repeat that same protocol the next time you do it. Now, in terms of running, we, we've obviously talked about cycling, but for the runners out there and the triathletes who might want to do both, this one is a little bit different in terms of most of you may not have access to something like a treadmill where, and, and a highly calibrated treadmill where you're able to actually monitor the exact speed for each stage. So what we do instead is we start to transition instead of a ramp test protocol like I described where we increase every minute or so until we get to VO2 max and we're trying to get there as quickly as possible. What we want to do is more of a time trial setup. And I'll put up on the screen a bit of a graphic uh, that I'm looking at now. And essentially, how do we determine what the right length time trial is really comes down to, uh, there's a bit of research done and I, I'll put up here in terms of what best estimates our VO2 max. And this is where we have to sh show a little bit of leeway because it is quite difficult um, to, to get bang on unless we can directly measure our oxygen consumption and we don't have a step test to, to go up and up and up and then oh, we can't continue anymore. So that's probably where our VO2 max is. But we have to come up with a, a, a time trial that is gonna be long enough to elicit a high enough intensity to match VO2 max, but not too long that we're not getting all the way up there, but also not too short that we're tapping too much in the anaerobic system. So it is a bit of a fine balance. And this research study that, that I've got up on the screen basically um, shows across a number of different distances, 1.2 kilometers, right up to 2.2 kilometers, um, the, the bias or I guess over or underestimation is what you can think about it here of the, the length of time trial in comparison to a VO2 max reading. And very, very simply what we see here, and I know the graph's a little bit blurry, but what we see is a 1.2K time trial heavily overestimated. Again, shorter distance, you can probably push more into the anaerobic systems. You'll be able to go a bit harder and faster. It's probably gonna overestimate what your VO2 max pace is. 2.2K is probably a bit long. And if you have a look at the, the left-hand side, so the, the y-axis, where we've got the zero mark, zero bias would be, it, it estimates it pretty closely. So we want the, we want these dots to, uh, in terms of the samples to be as close to that zero on the Y. And you can see here the 2K time trial is actually the best indicator of a VO2 max pace or VO2 max intensity. This is something for anyone who's watching who's involved in the team sport side of things. You might've heard of maximal aerobic speed or MAS. This is what a lot of team sport athletes use. And I use it when I'm in my footy mode or umpiring mode in terms of preparing there. We do a 2K time trial and then use that maximal aerobic speed, similar to what we have for maximal aerobic power. You can start to see these terms all link up to determine our high intensity running. And this is all we're doing. Instead of using the oxygen uh, consumption and, and having a look at what our gas exchanges, et cetera, we're now getting an estimate of that to give us the speed at which that's occurring or, or close to occurring to then be able to prescribe our sessions. So really simple, go out, do a warm up, 10, 15 minutes, do some stride throughs, do some running drills, whatever you need to do to get ready then get into a 2K time trial as flat as you can. For most people, this is gonna be pretty good. Now, this is the one thing I just wanna throw out there with the 2K time trial. If you're a reasonably trained athlete, and what I mean by that, you train quite consistently multiple times a week, and you're probably aiming somewhere between, I'm gonna say anywhere between, so six to seven and a half to eight minutes in length as a 2K time trial. This is probably gonna work really, really well. If you're on the slower side of things, um, this is probably going to not work as, as well because you're potentially running for uh, quite a lot longer period of time, closer to, let's say, 9, 10 minutes. You might actually want to go for like a 1500 meter time trial or maybe even a 1.8 because it might be more specific to your population. We're really trying to look for about a 6 to 7-ish minute effort is ideal, is going to give us a good representation of VO2 max. And that's why a 2K for most people will be good. If you fall faster than the 2K, maybe you have to do a slightly longer. Maybe you have to do close to a 3K time trial to get that. We need to shift this accordingly to your skill level, but for the most part, 2K time trial is gonna give you a more than enough information than what you need. 
And then again, from there, similar process to what I talked about in the bike. You can then estimate some percentages of that and get some pacing. It's not going to be perfect, but it is going to be a good field test alternative to what we can't maybe access in the lab at the moment or what you may not be able to access in the lab because of where you live normally or, or where you are in terms of your country or your resources that are available to you. So hopefully you got a little bit out of this video. I, I know it's a little bit of a, um, a, a difficult topic to get your head around sometimes testing, but there's just some simple testing protocols that you can implement in the field to get a little bit more out of your training, give you a bit more specificity and particularly get through a little bit more at the moment uh, when it is tricky to get some of that more ideal scenario testing done. If you do have any comments, make sure you do leave them below as always. If you haven't subscribed already, please hit subscribe. We're getting really close to 2000 subscribers as of recording this video and I'm really enjoying the support and, and creating the content for you guys. So make sure you do hit the subscribe button. That is it for today and we'll see you in the next one.